customer segmentation in Python. So the audience is for people who are very relatively new to data science in Python. I'll do a step-by-step -step walkthrough. So if you're already an expert, you're welcome to stay as well. Uh, you can check out my GitHub account here and directly look at the slides and the data sum and the sample data and code if you want to walk through as I'm talking. Customer segmentation is very important for um, every single business. Imagine if you can segregate your user base into different groups, then you can provide them with customized product and services. And customization normally makes people happy. That probably means higher profit for your company. It's great for the business. Take the 2012 um, Obama re-election campaign, for example. Obama has a data science team. They use very tailored messages to target the voters um, based on the behavioral data, demographic data, and financial data. So that definitely have helped Obama win a lot of undecided voters and the election as well. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to pretend I'm a new data scientist in this company called Ypedia. Um, it's one of the world's leading hotel booking companies. I'm really excited to join it. And obviously it has some competitors out there with similar names. So um, the mission of the company is to revolutionize how people travel through data and technology. So on my very first day of work, the CEO gave me a huge assignment. He has a board meeting coming up. He needs to answer a few questions, such as um, providing a report of underperforming and overperforming segments, and uh, how to tailor different new marketing campaigns uh, for different cities coming up in the next few weeks. And uh, the most important question, how to improve user booking rate, which is the bottom line of the business. So as a newbie in the company, I want to impress the CEO. I say, yes, I'm going to help you with that. So. What should I do? I go to our data engineering team and uh, they give me this CSV file. They give me this CSV file with a lot of numbers. And uh, I have need to come out of the work plan very quickly to answer the very difficult question for the board meeting. So um, I'm going to first explore the data, then understand what kind of user information I have in the first place. Then I'm going to try to use some of the basic data tactics um, to answer the three questions. So I know in Panda, I, can, I know in Python, I can use NumPy and Pandas that can help me easily explore the data. So first of all, um, I load the data. I load this CSV file into Pandas using the read CSV function in Pandas. Okay. Is it better? Okay, great. So and this this is this sample data is from the YPDA homepage and uh, a, um, the data engineering team has logged this basic information about what kind of information people are searching for and whether they have made a booking or not. So after we, um, after we load the data into a data frame, which is some, something similar to Excel table in Pandas, and uh, we can use function um, such as um, head to take a look at the first 20 rows of the data. So this is the kind of information we have in the database. So we have date, we have date time, which is um, which is timestamp when people make a booking. We have location data where um, where the user made a booking. So it's worth noting that the data here is um, anonymized into integers. So instead of seeing the actual location location name, the city name, we are seeing an integer here corresponding to a different value. And we have in information like whether the booking is made on mobile or not, whether there is a marketing package related to it, and uh, what marketing channel is it booking from, um, checking date, checkout date. Great, so these are really useful information. So um, in Pandas, uh, we can 
we can operate. We can use a few different operations um, on on data frame. We can do view. That's what we did just now. We can also select. We can also select data. Let's say if I want to just look at uh, the different site names we have, what I can do here is. You would, you would uh, in this way, I'm only selecting one column instead of the whole data frame. I can, we can also merge different data frame together into um, one table, into one data frame. And uh, we can also group by data frame to understand the aggregator numbers um, um, based, on the, based on the group values. That's something I'm going to demonstrate later on. So in Pandas, there are many different functions um, that's very easy to, that's very easy to use um, they can directly give you exploratory data analysis results. Um, for example, min and max um, and unix, it gives you a unique number of entries in a, in a column. And the describe function, info function, dtypes function, these are also very, very easy to use um, exploratory data analysis functions. You will see a lot of information um, of the data frame by just typing one word. So after we understand what data we have, um, the next step is to understand whether we can validate some of the business logic. So one of the biggest lessons I learned so far is really never trust the raw data given to you because whatever data that's given to you is very easy, um, it's, very, it's very common to have programming bugs when people are logging the data or human mistakes if this data entered by human beings. So in this case, um, there are a few business logics I want to check. The first one is, is the checking date actually um, later than the booking date? So you are booking a date for some, uh, you are booking a trip for some time in the future, not for some time that has already passed. And whether the checkout date should be greater than the checking date, so you are actually, you are staying for a positive number of days instead of a negative number of days. And the number of guests should be more than zero, so you are booking it not for a ghost, but for actual human beings. Yeah, so these are the, and there, there are definitely a lot more checks you can think of, and I encourage um, everyone who is out there doing data analysis to perform as many business logic checks as you can think of. So for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to check whether the checking date, um, are there any data entries where the checking date is actually um, after, whether I check it before the booking date. So I'm performing a select operation on data frame here. Here I'm going to select where the checking date. It's less than the booking date, yeah. Yeah, we do have uh, many entries um, where that doesn't follow this business logic. And it's interesting to take note that um, when for data frame operations, you can directly do add, subtract, and multiply, same as how we mani manipulate numbers here, which is one of the beauty of um, data frame operation. For example, when I create new variables, um, sample duration and uh, a duration or dates in advance, I'm directly using subtraction here between different columns. When we have, when we create new columns that with more complicated business logics, for example, um, I want to exclude those data entries we found invalid just now um, using a date check. Um, I, and I wanted to assign a null value to um, these data entries. That means um, I need to have write some if um, or else if function here. When the data logic is more complicated, um, we normally use a row operation instead of directly do a subtraction between two columns. We can define a row operation. So the operation then can be aligned row by row to the data columns. For example, I define a row, I define a function here um, duration that's to be applied to every single row in the data frame. Then later on, I can directly apply this function to the, to the whole um, data frame 
that's how I get my new column. So that's another common uh, operation in data frame. Okay, with this understanding with our data, so we can go ahead and answer the first question. What are some of the outperforming and underperforming segments? So here I'm going to introduce a different function that's called group by. So what group by does, it will split the data points in based on certain object, based on certain columns, into different based on uh, into different group values. Then you can apply an aggregate function on each of the group values. Then um, the last step is combine the results together to form a new data frame. Let's see how it's been done here. We can try to get the booking rate for every single channel. What I'm doing here is I'll group by the data frame based on the channel values. Then I will apply aggregate function mean and count to this column is booking. Is booking here is a binary column, it's either zero or one. So the mean of this column will give me a booking rate and the count of this booking and the, the count of uh, this column will give me the number of booking attempts. Let's see what we get. Yeah, so now we, we can see we get the number of bookings and uh, the booking rate for every single channel here. And it's worth noting that so after you apply a group by an aggregate function, the channel, which is a group name, will become an index. So instead of a common data frame column, you'll be an index. What we normally do is we will reset the index. So this group name will become a column name again. After that, you can sort the values by booking rate or sort the value by channel name um, up to your preference. Yeah, so let's take a look at um, channel zero here. Um, it has about 12,000 number of bookings and booking rate is 7.2%. This compared to the, the overall booking rate, let's take a look at what it is, which is 7.9%. So can I say this channel has a lower booking rate than the rest of other channels? So for all the economic and statistician out there, you might say um, that might not be true because um, I'm simply comparing the average. So what's the statistical significance behind it? So that leads us to the next question. How do we test the statistical significance of the outperformance? So I'm introducing a concept of t-sample, um, two-sample t-test here. Two-sample t-test is a hypothesis test for the equality between two binomial samples. And uh, in this case, I'm looking at the booking rate for each sample. And this is a binomial sample because uh, we are looking at data points where the value is either zero or one. That's how, why we call it binomial. And uh, in order to look at whether there's a real difference in a, in a probability distribution of the two samples, uh, we need to understand the concept of random, error sam uh, random sampling error. So, if we see the difference between the two samples, is it because of random sampling error or because there is a real underlying difference between the two samples? So um, introducing a concept of z-score and p-value here, which some of you are probably familiar with. So the p-value um, is a value that measures how likely, um, how likely the difference we see is actually due to random sampling error and uh, the underlying distribution is actually the same. So if the p-value is very small, that means uh, the two distributions we're looking at are indeed different. So let's look how we implement this in Python. I created a function here called stats comparison. So I'm using, looking at a formula here, I need to get n, which is a number of bookings, and p, which is a booking rate, for both, um, for t both samples. And I calculate uh, n and p for the first sample. Then I can calculate n and p for the rest of the bookings. Then I use the SciPy, I use the, um, I use the stats package from SciPy to calculate the z-score and the p-value. And uh, added a new column here, significant, 
um, if the value is one, sorry, if the p value is less than 0 0.1, then I can confidently say the two samples are indeed different. So assign value one, negative one, and zero. If it's significantly larger, smaller, whether it's, it's not significant at all. So let's perform this function in um, in a channel we are looking at just now. So that's the result we have. We can ignore all these intermediate values I use here to calculate the z square and p value. Let's look at um, channel zero again. Yes, its booking rate is seven point two percent, and uh, for other bookings um, other than this subsegment, the average booking rate is eight point one percent, and we can. We can say this, this channel is performing worse than average with statistical conf confidence. And, uh, and some of the channels here where, uh, where the booking rate is actually, where, where the number of bookings is very small, we can see that we cannot, is the sample size is not big enough for us to test the st statistical significance. So with that, we can confidently answer the first question. Here is a list of outperforming segments. Here is a list of underperforming segments. And there are some segments here. We simply don't have enough data to say um, it is outperforming, underperforming. So with that, we can move on to, to our next question. How do we tailor different marketing campaigns for different cities? So before we understand how to tailor different marketing campaigns, we need to understand what are different clusters of cities out there? What are the characteristics? After understanding that, we can think about how do we tailor our marketing campaigns. So I'm going to introduce um, the idea of clustering here, which is what we call unsupervised um, learning in machine learning terms. So unsupervised learning, it means that there is no label assigned to each city. You can consider each city as one data point we are looking at here. Um, there's no label assigned to it. And um, clustering help us find the underlying structure um, among these data points. <coughs> so in Python, um, we can use sklearn package. It has um, all the common machine learning algorithm um, estimators um, we can use. And uh, for these unsupervised estimators, um, such as k-means or um, SVM, um, the common the common function we use is model predict. The predict function will help us predict model in a clustering algorithm. So the way you run machine learning algorithm in Pandas is very standard. You create the object of the uh, algorithm estimator, then you use um, predict to predict label in a clustering algorithm. There are a few steps that I normally follow um, when I create clustering in, in pandas. First one we need to, first step is um, we need to understand what are the features uh, we can use. So in this case, our goal is to distinguish different cities. So we need to understand what are the characteristics, what are the features that distinguish one city from the other. Then um, this can come from your business sense. Um, this also can come from the exploratory analysis you did just now. I selected eight different features, which, which I think are going to be relevant here. Then uh, what I'm doing here is I'm going to the group by function I explained just now. I use group by to create the city level data for these metrics. And the second step is to understand uh, whether we should standardize the data. By standardizing the data, I mean getting a number of standard deviations from the average. So this step is very important, especially for clustering mechanism like k-means, because when we calculate the distance between different variables, if the magnitude of one variable is a lot larger than another variable, so we are putting a lot more weight into one variable instead of the other. For example, if one variable is in a magnitude of thousands, and whereas another variable is in the magnitude of a single digit. So the distance between the, the first variable, we have much larger weight in terms of overall distance compared to the second one. So by standardizing the, by standardizing the data, we can avoid this problem. So the next step, we need to choose a um, clustering method. I'm using k-means here, and uh, also number of clusters. Number of clusters, um, I'm choosing an ad hoc. Three, number three here, um, you can imagine the marketing campaign 
budget only allows three different marketing campaigns for three different types of cities. So that's definitely subject to a business context and what how many classes you, know, you want to get. And there are also a lot of different methods out there for you to determine what is the optim, optimal number of K. Right? One of the um, common methodology you can use is what we call Apple method. So you help you select um, the optimal number of K. Um, even you increase the number of K at the point, um, the, it's not going to help you fit the model better. Yeah. Yes, as I mentioned just now, um, the way to create a clustering algorithm in, um, using C SK Learn is very easy. You create the object, you specify the parameter in here, and class equals three. Then you can imme immediately feed the data. So with two lines of code, you created a clustering algorithm. Great, let's run this. Great, so now we created these three clusters in the eight feature space, eight dimensional space. How do we visualize the data? We know we can visualize 2D data, 3D data, probably not 8D data. So one way to visualize the data is to use a technique called principal component analysis. So it help you reduce the eight dimensional space into two dimensional space. You can imagine component, uh, principal component analysis is something like it will reduce the dimensional space, but the still tries to maintain the data variability within the raw data. So in that way, you can get a two-dimensional graph that maintains uh, that maintains a lot of uh, the variation in the data. I'm using the package decomposition and a function PCA here, and um, again. With one line of code, you can easily um, reduce the dimension from eight to two. With that, I can plot. I can make a scatter plot based on the two dimension we have. Um, then let's see what this graph shows. So this is um, three clusters we created just now. One color um, indicates one cluster. And this is a good, this is a good illustration of the basic principles behind k-means. Um, points with that are very close to each other are in the same cluster. So, how would this be useful? Right. So we have these three different city clusters. How do we apply it in this marketing campaign context? So, we need to understand what are the exact differences in the business metrics for these three different clusters. Here, um, I need to merge the, data, merge the data first. Merge is another common operation for data frame in pandas. Um, this is a standardized data I used just now. I selected uh, user location, city, and cluster from this standardized data frame, then merge it with the original data that's before standardization. And using a common column, which is a user, com user location city here, then I group by the user, I group by um, cluster, then I get the mean of all the business metrics for each cluster. Yeah, so we have cluster 0, 1, 2 here. Let's see how they are being different. Right? So let's look at cluster 1. You can see that people in cluster 1 stay for a lot longer. And uh, they also book a lot more in advance. And uh, they travel a lot more. They travel a lot further. And uh, for cluster zero here, for cluster zero here, um, they tend to be a larger group with a higher number of adults, higher number of children, and they book more rooms. So these are probably the family types who always travel with a larger group. So by understanding these characteristics of different clusters, so your marketing campaigns can tailor to the specific purpose of why people travel. And um, that means your marketing campaign are going to be more effective because you know how to target them exactly. Great, so um, and other than marketing, there are a few other common uses of um, clustering. For example, insurance, um, by grouping different policy holders into different groups, you can understand what other policy holders we have a higher average claim costs. 
So that might help you set the premium price for different uh, for different insurance policies. And for city planning, if you have a large number of households and you want to build community centers, it's important to understand what are different clusters based on the house type, value, geographical locations. Yeah. So with that, we can go ahead and answer our next question, which is basically um, how do we improve how do we improve the chance of booking for individuals? Before I understand what triggers people to um, how do we do that? Like we need to understand what triggers people to have a high chance of booking. What are the factors that lead to people who are more likely to make a booking? So I'm introducing a concept of supervised learning here because when we look at individual user data, we have a label associated with each data point. The label here is whether the person has made a booking or not. So what decision tree does, it will split the data into different subset and um, they will try to make sure the subset is either all zero, either all one. So, and the data is splitting in a way that you will choose um, the attribute that explain that does the best job at splitting the data first. For example, um, the example I show here is duration less than, um, less than equal to 2.5, so people who only stay for one or two days um, are very different from people who stay more than that. So that's how the data is being split up. Again, we can use package from uh, sklearn, the tree, decomposition, cross-validation, and so on. The steps are very similar to clustering, but one major difference here is because this is, um, we, are, we are using the data points, we're using the data sample with labels, so we can split the data first into test and train. We can build a model based on the training data, then later we can test the accuracy of it using the test data. So using test, train, test, split, this single function, I can split the data into um, test and train with the test size being 20% of the data. Um, I then create an object using under the decision tree classifier class. Then again, similarly, I feed the data with um, the features I have and uh, the outcome variable, which is the label here. So. Let's see what that gives me. Yeah, so in this case, I'm using the cluster zero from the sample. After we create a decision tree, we can visualize the data to see what it looks like. To visualize the decision tree, I'm using pi.data here. So I convert the decision tree into a pi.data. Then I use a function export graph width to plot the graph of, what the, uh, of the decision tree after converting it to a PDF. Okay. This is expected because um, the sample I'm using is only 200. So that's also one of the limitations of decision tree. If your sample size is very small and, uh, and you set very stringent conditions, such as I want to have six different leaf loads and the minimum sample is at least 200, right? So that's the incompatibility of your sample size and the parameters you are using. So in this case, I'm using a cluster zero Let's see what are the different what are the other clusters here. Sorry. So I'll sample group by I'll group by the cluster and to see what is the count for different cluster. So we see um, for cl cluster two has a much larger sample. So let's use cluster two here to see what we get. Okay, great. So with the larger sample, we get a much nicer tree. So let's look at the left side of the tree here. So for people who are staying only for one or two days, and uh, only with one adult, and they are booking really, you know, zero days in advance. That means they are doing the same day booking. 
um, we can see the probability of booking. In this case, uh, the first value here is a number of zero. This uh, second value here is number one. So the overall booking rate here is almost like 30%, 30 percent, 30 plus percent, right? So this is compared to average booking rate of only 8 percent. So you can see people are traveling in very small groups and they're not booking very much in advance. They have a much higher chance of booking. And similarly, you can see other branches where we give you, uh, we give you subgroups that have a much lower chance of booking. So with that in mind, you can customize your product and services to nudge people to book more. For example, um, if someone is booking 90 days in advance or 180 days in advance, you know this person is probably less likely to book. In that case, um, your marketing campaign, you can target them with a marketing promo code. And for your product, you can nudge them, um, boom, you can nudge them um, with nicer features. For example, a features um, like a recommendation for, um, recommendation for the season we are going to travel. So with this kind of customized product and services, by understanding the chance, actual chance of um, booking, um, you can improve the overall chance of booking for your website. Yeah, so besides product marketing, uh, another common use case in decision tree is weather forecasting. What kind of signals will more likely to lead to rain? Yeah, so we have written probably less than 100, code, 100 lines of code now. And um, we answer some of the really hard questions for the board meeting. And this is some of the basic customer segmentation in Python. And uh, at least some of the resources here, you can explore and further learn more about it. Um, my best advice is uh, uh, really dive into our problems and uh, get a data set you are very interested in and analyze it. And how you improve, um, how you improve your data analysis skills, how you improve, how you apply the data to business context is just to practice. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? We have the slides yeah. somewhere for you. Okay. Yeah, balance PyCon SG 2016. Last question over here. I am Jean. Uh, thank you for sharing this with us. Uh, one simple question. How would you assess the effectiveness of your clustering of decision tree using only offline validation? So what that means is without AD testing, how you assess it? So maybe you can create five different models and you have the budget to only test one or two. Mm -hmm. From that, how would you pick? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So I think before you decide which algorithm to use, you need to first understand the data. For example, k-means, um, the k-means algorithm I demonstrated just now is only suitable for certain type of data because for every um, machine learning algorithm there, we are making huge assumptions about what kind of data we have. For example, machine k-means is very bad for elongated data. It's assuming the clusters are round, right? So if you know your data set as something that's not run clusters, that's probably something you shouldn't use. And uh, in order to validate the data, there are a few techniques you can, you can use without A-B testing. For example, you can use cross-validation. That means you keep training your data using different proportion of test and train. And to only, um, then you get the, you only get the optimal um, model with the best, with the highest um, accuracy. So that, um, that these are mechanics you can use to make sure the model but the parameters they are using are optimal. But I would say um, there's nothing that can replace A-B testing to understand uh, how, if A-B testing a lot about behavioral response, it's about after you have the intervention, how people are going to respond to it, right? So all my talk, um, I think all this methodology I demonstrated just now is only on the very first part about what kind of, um, what kind of data structure, what kind of uh, data insights you can get to understand what are actions that might likely to lead to a difference in behavior. For example, um, I'm assuming banners and the higher chance and lower chance of booking, you can come up with ideas for the intervention. But the effective intervention, that's a whole different story and how people are going to respond to it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.